Well, we're out here on a beautiful February day in Woodford County. I'm here with Joe Lacefield. Joe, several years ago, you and I did a three-part series on how to make a self-bow. That's right. And we went through the whole entire process, but you know what? We kind of skipped an important step. What was that? Well, we didn't cut a tree and cut it into staves. I had a tree that was already down, and I did split that tree, but we didn't actually pick one and cut it. So that's a, the biggest part of doing it yourself. The type of wood that we used that day for your bow was a what? So the bow that I actually made for the show was a Kentucky coffee tree. Tell me some other species of trees that make for really good self bows. Eastern hop hornbeam makes a great self bow. Dogwood, you know, both of those are white woods. Mm -hmm. Hackberry is very underrated for a bow because it grows straight. It's very common in central Kentucky. So it's a wood that's available to almost anyone. Can you tell me your favorite? It is a tree that you find all over the state of Kentucky pretty frequently. What is what? Osage orange, hedge okay. apple. They were brought into Kentucky as a living fence row. Okay, so if you wanted to find the perfect Osage tree, what would you be looking for? You don't want to try to look for the perfect Osage to make a bow with out in a field. Because mm -hmm. when you get a tree out in the field, it just has branches everywhere. Mm -hmm. You want a tree that's in the woods, that's growing straight up, that has a pretty good crown, then you're going to have good growth rings because it's competing with the forest canopy for sunlight. So that tree should be pretty void of limbs along the main trunk. If it has a lot of limbs, you have knots you have to work around and all that, which makes a very complicated bow. Interestingly enough, we're standing right here on the edge of this forest because you have been watching an Osage tree that as a self bow maker, you were like, one of these days. One of these days, that is a perfect tree to cut some staves out of. And we're gonna showcase what makes this tree really good. And then we're gonna go and actually cut some staves and get all the way up to the process to where we started our three part series several years ago. That's right. So Bill, I know you've been making bows for quite a few years, haven't you? Yes, I've been working on bows now for about nine or 10 years. Did you have a background in woodworking or what made you want to do this? I've always enjoyed building things. Even when I was a kid, I was always building one thing or another in my dad's shop and I started out with muzzle loading. Okay. And started building some muzzle loaders. That got a little expensive with all the hardware, but I wanted something a little more challenging. I always liked to hunt. So I got into self bows. When you build a self bow, do you build all of them for hunt? Or some of them look like pieces of art. I mean, they literally have got that much time, effort, and energy. And when you look at it, you're like, wow, this thing's too pretty to take hunting. Are they all built for the purpose of hunting? I do make them to hunt with, so you can beat them around. You can make them as fancy as you want and take more time to do that. But I do like making some that are pretty showy sometimes. If you really want to get fancy with some of them, I've put snake skins on the backside of them just for maybe some decoration, but also can be used as camouflage on the back of it. One that I've kind of developed and I've taught a couple of people how to do it is the feather back bow, taking turkey feathers across their breast and over their shoulders and pulling those feathers and actually laying those feathers on the back side of the bow. How many bows do you think you've made? Well, over 150 probably, oh, somewhere around wow. that many. Wow. I spend quite a bit of time between, I don't know, 40 to maybe sometimes even 80 hours on a bow. What would you give to be able to sit down and watch a Native American go through the process of building a bow? Because I promise you, they had tricks that we don't know today. Oh, right, and they do it much differently. You gotta realize they built bows strictly to survive. Yeah. I built bows for a hobby, and they built them to survive and probably had a lot more shortcuts that wasn't near as technical as we make it. So it would be interesting. This is actually a bigger Osage right here. It is. You can get some bows out of this. You know, it has some branches, it has some knots, it has some wavy grain to it. This is better than average as far as you look at a quality of an Osage. This wood's really, really hard. But then you get a knot involved in it, and that's going to be much more difficult. Right. It's a really nice tree, but it's not the specimen that that is. Five or six years ago, you marked this tree and you told me, hey, this tree right here has got a lot of characteristics that you really, really like in a tree. It does. It has a really straight grain. You know, it's not, you're not seeing the grain pattern spiral around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's called propeller twist when you have that. This tree doesn't have knots. There's a few places that there might have been a limb at one time, but for the most part, it is really, really nice. It's about 10 inches in diameter here at chest height. You know, I think you can get with this one section at least four, if not five or six staves, and then you're going to have a shorter section 
with what we call billets that you can put two pieces together and make a bow. Okay. So we got a couple things to do. We got to figure out where we're going to drop this tree. What do you think? Well, we're going to have to take it that way, but we're going to have to remove a couple of these other trees to keep it from hanging up off the ground. Okay. We need this how many inches? About 70, 80 inches, right? Right, at least six feet. When you make a finished bow, it pretty much needs to be generally as long as you are tall. Okay. All right, so Joe, now this is the log you've really been looking for. Now that you've got it down, you can see the rings and everything else is going on inside. Tell me what you like or what you don't like. Well, it has really good ring ratios, meaning these thinner, bright yellow rings are thinner. You want the thicker wood to be your bow material mostly. You see that you got a dark ring and then a light ring. Well, that light ring is a spongy material that when you're chasing the ring, you hit that and it's real spongy and corky and pops right off and you know you've got a pristine uh, ring by scraping all of that light ring off. The outside surface of your bow is really going to be this, what you're seeing, this darker yellow. The edge of the darker yellow. You know, we have some uh, wind check here, these dark marks, so we're going to split based on those. That'll be our first split. And then I see another check here. So basically what I'm anticipating us getting here is, you know, you kind of cut this like a pie. And optimally, if my marker worked, you'd see six staves if it splits that way. How are you gonna split this? So I'm gonna take a wedge and get it started. Then we're gonna leapfrog wedges all the way down to the end until we get it in half. There you go. And then we're gonna seal the ends so that they won't crack as water evaporates from the wood. They're gonna be stored in a location where they're gonna be humidity controlled, right? Right. How can you tell, hey, it's time? I mean, you can weigh it. When it, you check it each month and it's no longer losing weight, then it's at equilibrium with what the relative humidity is wherever you're storing the staves. Okay. We got seven nice staves out of that tree. That's pretty impressive for an Osage and one log, right? It is, you know, and it wasn't that big of a tree. They were all really good straight staves. It didn't have any spiral to it. <laughs> 